Please remain standing and turn in your Bibles to John chapter 14. It's John chapter 14. You'll find that on page 102 and 103 in your pew Bible if you did not bring your Bible with you today. We'll be looking at the familiar passage that is probably the only passage used more at a funeral is Psalm 23 than this passage. But you'll want to keep your Bible with you after you're seated and have prayer because we're going to look at more about who Thomas is. We're going to read just the first uh, seven or eight verses of this rather than the first 14. Hear the now the word of the scripture. John chapter 14, beginning with verse 1. Jesus says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you, don't know, you do know him, and you have seen him. This is the word of God for you and me, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated and let us bow together in prayer. May your spirit, O God, stand between me and your people so that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together will be shaped, formed, and molded into the good news of the gospel of Christ, in whose name we have gathered, in whose name we pray, and in whose name we will seek to always serve faithfully. And all of God's people did say. I've always found a few signs to capture my attention, and I've kept them in my memory for a number of years. One of the ones that I remember discussing with a clergy friend was having lunch not too far from a place that had a sign in the window that said, Free Haircuts. And my clergy friend said, that's not going to be a free haircut. You're going to pay for it one way or the other. One I saw a number of years ago in a mall in the Dallas area that I've never, every, I just think, I laugh when I think of it. The sign in the window of the place that had all the little jewelry and ear piercings said the following and listen carefully. Ears pierced while you wait. Because the option is? As I was preparing this week, I had to go to Lowe's on Coulter and was back in the back portion of the store, and there's a sign across from the um, employee break room that caught my eye. I posted it on Facebook this morning. It's painted on the cinder block. It's huge. It says, safety is when nothing happens. Safety is when nothing happens. And for whatever reason, as I looked at this text and thought about how we're going to look at the way that Thomas represented here and often thought of as doubting Thomas, it's not the only thing about his life, but how often do each of us have some particular event or particular relationship or decision, and we think that that alone defines all of our life. It does not. Our life is the full movie, not a particular scene. It's the whole book, not a page in a chapter. And so we're going to look more about who Thomas is. But I thought about what would our motto be on the wall at Polk Street? Because the reality is, if we're just looking for safety and comfort, i.e., we're looking for no conflict, then that's a great motto for the church wall. Discipleship is where nothing happens. Following Christ is where nothing happens. But I think you would agree with me that if you're going to be a follower of Christ and give your life to Christ, then something ought to happen. It's not a safe thing to be a follower, but it is a certain thing to be a follower of Christ. Thomas is given a bad rap, in my opinion, in some ways. 
Because I think Thomas, and this is sort of the overarching thing, we're going to look at Scripture, unpack some things about him, but I want you to know I'm going to wrap this sermon up with a very practical tool that's almost like a therapy session, okay? But I think it works. Otherwise, I would not present it to you. So first, the, the scriptural piece. Thomas stays connected. Thomas has courage and honesty and is willing to engage reality. And oftentimes we hear this passage, Thomas asks the question, well, how are we going to know where you're going to go? Well, let's find out why Thomas asked that question. If this were a case in a court, I would present to you the first item of um, evidence that Thomas wasn't just a doubter. Look in chapter 13, and we're going to start at verse 31. And this is the immediate the set of verses that precedes what we just read in John chapter 14. Jesus is named that Judas is his betrayer. And so in verse 31, when Judas had gone out, Jesus turns the disciples. He says, now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I'm only with you a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, I now say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment that you love one another just as I loved you. You also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And then Simon Peter said, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus answered, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow me afterward. And Peter said to him, Lord, why can't we follow you now? I'll lay down my life for you. And then Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the cock crows, you will have denied me three times. And then we move into the 14th chapter where Thomas asked that question, Lord, how will we know the way? Isn't it interesting that Thomas is the one who seems in this text, as we back up a little bit, to have stayed connected in the conversation? He heard the banter back and forth between Jesus and Peter. He was listening carefully as Jesus said, where I'm going, you can't go. And then the always impetuous Peter, Lord, I'm going, I want to go. No matter what. And so Thomas asked a relevant question connected to his relationship with Christ. And yet, throughout history, we call him Doubting Thomas. And part of the reason we call him Doubting Thomas is also because one of these recorded at the end of the Gospel of John when it shows that he was born in Missouri. Because <laughs> Jesus shows up to the disciples, he wasn't there, and what does Thomas say? You know the record. He says, hey, I'm not going to believe it till I can see it. And we do that all the time. And those two passages are sort of connected. They say, that's who Thomas is. Thomas is the doubter. It's doubting Thomas. It's the speculative Thomas. But Thomas was connected. Thomas stayed connected. He was engaged in the conversation. And based on what he heard, he had a valid question. My friends, you and I have valid questions when we engage our faith in life. Because being a disciple means that something is going to happen. And some of those things that happen we are going to have no explanation for. And some of those things are going to happen are give big doubts to us. And in some of the ways that those things happen, the only good news that there is is that God is with us in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of answers that don't come, in the midst of struggles, in the midst of the times when there is no resolution, in the times of brokenness, in the times of hurt. God is with us. The words of John Wesley on his deathbed, his final words were, the best of it is, God is with us. And he was right. The best of it is that God is with us. But what about this Thomas, this doubting Thomas? I want you to turn your Bible back to the 11th chapter of the Gospel of John. Chapter 11. What's happening in chapter 11 is that Jesus is talking to the disciples. The word of Lazarus has come out, and he's dead, and they need to go back to Judea. And we're going to read just a couple of verses here. First, verses 7 and 8. Word comes that Lazarus 
was dead. In verse 7, Jesus says, after he said this to the disciples, he, Jesus said, let's go to Judea again. The disciples said to Jesus, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and you're going there again? And then Jesus goes on to chide them a little bit, talking about how many days there are, etc. He says they're sleeping. The disciples say, what do you mean just sleeping? I call this the college station passage of the Gospel of John because the disciples just don't get it. <laughs> and finally, Jesus, Jesus said, look, he's dead, okay? Not just sleeping, but dead. Now that I've offended the Aggies, let me restore your trust. What do you call a graduate of A&M? Employed. Or if they've been to the core, sir. Thank you, Gary Moore. Look over in verse 15 now. Judea is where they were going to stone Jesus. Jesus said, let's go back again. The disciples say, no, that didn't work so good. Verse 15, for your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there. And he means with Lazarus so that you may believe, but let's go to him. Jesus is compelling the disciples. Let's go, guys. Let's go back to Judea. Something amazing is going to happen there. And all the disciples are not having it except one, except one. And who is it? Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Don't hear that a lot, do you? Thomas, the only one with the courage. When everybody else said, no, you know, bon Bonhoeffer hadn't written the cost of discipleship yet, so we're not going to go that deep into following you yet. We know how tough this is. I don't like the persecution, all the negativity in Judea, you know. And their falafel isn't good there anyway. So, you know, Thomas is the only one, the only disciple who had the courage to say, Jesus, if that's where you're going, count me in, coach. I'm going with you. And whatever the fate is that you have is the Christ is going to be my fate. And all the other disciples wanted to live by a motto on the wall that said, safety is where nothing happens. But that's not our life. It's not your life. It's not my life. You and I are not called to a life of comfort nor a life of safety. We're called to live in that place that's sometimes mystery, sometimes clarity. We're called to live in that place that Paul talks about in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. that says that the God who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. Or as the old phrase says, it's all going to work out in the end. If it hasn't worked out, it's not the end. Life is a process filled with moments like Thomas between doubt and clarity. And if we were really honest, it's really about our doubting what God can do. And what you do about your doubts really is about how close you are in relationship to Christ. Now, I'm going to step on some toes and just ask you a few things. Uh, no need to raise hands. But I would wonder how many of us would say that we have a daily habit of reading Scripture. I'm not talking about you get something on your phone and while you're at the stoplight, you open it up or you get a free moment at lunch. I'm talking about do you have a discipline of reading Scripture? Do you have a personal discipline of prayer? Do you have a personal discipline of fasting? What are the spiritual disciplines that you put into practice or do you just show up on Sunday morning and say, well... I'll get a little bit of this stuff, and it'll be good till next week. And if I really wanted to be offensive, I'd say, how many of you have actually even read anything since you heard the Scripture read here last week? My friends, when you don't live in the Scriptures, when you don't live in God's presence, you make a choice not to draw near to God. And the promise of the book of James is any time that we choose to move and draw near to God, God's always going to draw near to us. 
God is the prodigal parent reflected in Luke chapter 15 who's on the porch watching and waiting and looking at the horizon, waiting for us to return. And for most of us, it is not that glorious story of going to a foreign land and spoiling everything. It's just getting so busy we haven't spoken to or read or thought about what God wants of us since last we gathered in this place. What are you doing about that? And then to kind of a wrap up today, we're going to do two things. I'm going to share a closing story with you, but before we get there, you have an insert. And this insert is called the geneogram. Not only do we talk about what your time is spent in Scripture and God's place in your life, but I want to kind of do a, it's not really scriptural, it's just something that I've Edwin Freeman did this. This is just good stuff, okay? This is simple good stuff. And this is the Reader's Digest cliff note version of Edwin Freeman's family system theories in the geneogram. Now, Dixie or Margie or Kevin and I will help you kind of unpack this, but generally what you do is you see you've got a circle there, and it's really obvious who you are, right? You're in the middle. You can see that? You're you, okay? You're you. If you need to, you can write your name there. And then what you're going to do is you're going to think about the people who have influence in your life, okay? Don't think of God yet. God's going to come in a minute. I want you to think of all the people who have influence in your life. The size of the circle is how much influence they have in your life. And then the length of the line is how close they are to you. And the best way to do this is to take this home and get out an 11 by, uh, eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper and do this because you're going to have stuff all over the place. I will often do this with couples in premarital counseling, having them fill it out separately on eight and a half by 11 sheets. And then what I do is we just sit there in front of a bright light and do this with one behind the other. And it's amazing that one will say, I didn't know you thought that much of them. I didn't know much they had much influence over your life. Or you didn't even put that person on there. Because the people around us have a great influence on us. Now, if you do that, you put all those together. For example, if I were filling this out now, my largest circle and closest proximity to me would be my wife, Sean. Because she's the person who has the greatest influence in my life. Words of encouragement, words of correction. How much each one is is none of your business. But she has a great deal of influence. She's the person that I trust the most and around the most, and that's the, that's the circle. I think of my father's deceased, but he still has an influence in my life, and so I would put him kind of a distance, and the line would be long, but the circle would be there. People who are impacting my life, people I work with in the staff, people in the life of this church. And then when I look at all these influences in my life, then I'm going to look at how big would God's circle be and where would God fit in all of that? See, don't put God first because we all tend to, oh yeah, yeah, God's there, yeah. And then you don't think about it again. Do all the other relationships. Some of those relationships are healthy and they fill you up. Some of those relationships are like a drain plug and they're sucking the life out of you and you need to work on some boundaries. If you need some boundary work, talk to me. I've got a couple of really good books that'll help you learn to say things like no which is a good word to find sometimes. And I say all that to say this. We need as a church to individually think about the capacity that we have to be in God's presence and that capacity to reflect God's love to the world. Capacity is a word that I've fallen in love with recently. You know, in the life of the church over the last, I've been in ministry 30 years, Dixie's been in ministry over 30 years, it would be fun to sit down together sometime and find out through the decades what the latest thing, the best thing for the church would be. Do you remember when it was Kirby John Caldwell in having classes for membership? And no matter who you were, you had to go to a class to be able to join the church. And that was going to solve the church's problems because it worked at Kirby John's church, so everybody started doing it. We've had... I mean this respectfully. We've had gimmick after gimmick after gimmick. Bring a friend Sunday. Put this sign out. Put out door hangers. You know, all those things. Wear this kind of vest. Do this kind of button. 
all those things. But lately, the shift in the life of the church has been about a more substantive aspect. And the word capacity is one that's being used, talking about pastors and leaders in the church raising their capacity. Capacity is the ability to hold something. And I've fallen in love with the word capacity. Thomas had a large capacity of God's presence. He could ask questions. He was daring to go back to Judea no matter what it held. He would say, okay, Jesus, I know you talked to Peter about this, but I still don't get it. Help me out here. He had a large capacity. Collectively as a church, we'll only have an impact on the world as it relates to our collective capacity to make room in our lives for God's presence. And the more that we spend time with God in prayer and the reading of Scripture and the spiritual disciplines, the greater capacity or the greater or the bigger the bucket of our soul that we make for God's presence. And what I find is as I do that personally, then I have a greater capacity to reflect God's love in the world. A very simple example. I want you to imagine that you and I are driving down I-40. We've made our way out of downtown, and we're going to head west. So we've dealt with all those people who don't understand which lane eventually merges all the way to the right. We've dealt with those people who are coming along and decide that the last minute they're going to exit Washington, and we've taken a deep breath and gone underneath the Washington Bridge, right? But behold, there is coming before us the on-ramp from, West, from Georgia. And there's a large semi in our left in the middle lane right next to us. And we're in the right-hand lane. And the person who's choosing to merge onto I-40 West from Georgia thinks they have the right of way at 40 miles an hour while we're doing 60 and just pulls across that solid line in front of us. A low capacity gets you in touch with the meaning of original sin. A high capacity lets you hit the brakes, take a deep breath, and realize you don't have any idea what's happening in that car ahead of you, and not be reactive. That's an incredibly simple thing, but I promise you, every one of you has a Georgia on-ramp waiting to happen in your life. Every one of you. And our capacity to not react in incredibly negative and hurtful ways directly related to one simple concept or a group of concepts, the reading of Scripture, the spiritual disciplines, spending time in prayer, being connected to God. Because when you're connected to God like that, then you'll know those moments when you can say, if it's Judea, it's Judea. God, I don't get it. Can, 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 you, can you hang with me a little longer? Can you explain that again? That's your capacity factor, to stay connected to the love of God in Christ. Now, sometimes we think about doubts as bad things. I'm about to read you something from somebody's journal. The old little game where I'm going to give you a few clues, and then you have to figure out who it is. So this is group participation. So when you think you know who this is, go ahead and sound it out, and I'll stop giving clues. She died in September of 1997. Well, a lot of people died in 1997. But hang on. It, I'm guessing that there's going to be at least one or two people that are going to just nail this immediately. So I'm going to try and go with the harder clue. She worked with the poor in Calcutta, India. Mother Teresa, right? I say Mother Teresa, what comes to your mind? Sainthood, right? She was beautified as a saint. I mean... As much as we say doubting Thomas, and that conjures up the images, when we say Mother Teresa, images of faithfulness and deep belief, that, don't they just conjure up for you? I mean, golly, what an amazing saint of God, walking barefoot, living with the poor. You know, she had to be connected to God. She had to have such a deep and abiding faith. But her personal letters and memoirs were published. That kind of happens when the Catholic Church wants to move you to the level of saint. Even your private writings become public. But even in her death, she gives to you and me a gift. For we think that she was unshakable in faith and immovable and had it all together. And in many ways she did. 
But listen to what she wrote about her own life and this dance between certainty and doubt. She said this, where is my faith? Even deep down, right in there, there's nothing but emptiness and darkness. My God, how painful is this unknown pain. It pains without ceasing. I have no faith. I dare not utter the words and thoughts that crowd my heart and make me suffer untold agony. So many unquestioned answers live within me. God, please forgive me. From the heart of Mother Teresa. So my friends, you've got questions. You've got doubts. What makes you so special if Mother Teresa could live with them? Welcome to the human journey. Welcome to the place where a God who loves you so much he'd love you to death so he could love you to life is never threatened by a question, but will always invite you some days to go to Judea and some days to hang in the conversation. The question for you is, what's going to be on the wall? What can't go on the wall at Polk Street is, This is a safe place. Nothing ever happens here. It's going to be a dangerous place for you. And I pray that your capacity to receive what God gives will increase. So your capacity to offer to others would also be increased. Let us pray. God, we live in a world of answers So forgive us when we seem to rush in with an answer before we really engage the question and struggle with where you are in our life. Help us to reflect on what it means to be a follower of Christ and to learn from people like Thomas and Mother Teresa. Help us be able to give to you all of our life so that all we are, all that we think, our failures, our perceived successes, God, you can just use those as a way of sharing your love of the world. We pray these things in the name of Christ, who is the Lord of our life. And all of God's people did say, amen.